everyone, and we are back with a brand new episode of Capes and Commentaries podcast. Not that we were gone for very long, but we are here with a new episode regardless. Uh, I'm Tyler Baker, and uh, with me as always, my best buddy, Nasty Nate Kennedy. And uh, we're here to add a little extra uh, excitement to your weekend. Maybe a little extra listen if you need something to listen to on a drive over the holiday weekend or something like that. Or listen to, to fall asleep to. Or if you're with family and they're just pissing the hell out of you try, while trying to have a good time, we have we're providing a little a little fun for your ears, a little a little uh, excitement uh, over the Memorial Day weekend that uh, things are just not going your way. You know what? We got a little fun discussion to give to you to kind of we got your back and we got your we, back yeah. we, and hopefully we don't let you down. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, you know, we we then again too, we don't hear much feedback, so I guess if we suck. <laughs> And in this day and age where people love to go out of the way to say, you suck, eat your dash, kill yourself, you suck balls. And, well, we haven't really gotten that kind of uh, So, feedback. yeah, we, we so, must be doing okay. We must be doing all right. Uh, as discombobulated as this podcast can be at times, but we, we still give people the commentaries that come after. And uh, we haven't been called out for being, you guys are full of shit. You guys don't know anything about X-Men or Spider-Man or Batman or anything else for that matter. Like, nah, we haven't been told that. So, I guess, you yeah, know. I'm just, sure it's uh, coming. Yeah, I'm sure there's somebody out there who's eventually playing. we'll get there. Leave yeah. a comment down below if we suck. Yeah, or if I blink too much, or and Nate, you don't like Nathan's facial hair. Yeah, or I mean, uh, I, to be fair, I don't really like it that much either. <laughs> but you know, it is what it is. No, I'm just making fun of that one jerk off at oh, the yeah, Saturday yeah. in the chat room, just saying weird stuff about us. Well, so. I, yeah, I know. Oh well, but uh, but yeah, yeah, we, uh, before we get into our our Batman commentary, we were gonna do uh, some uh, quick reviews on uh, some current stuff that's just just come out to kind of give yeah. our recommendations to let you know that uh, we focus on all the old stuff, but it's nice to know there is some new stuff that has come out and gives us uh, we give a, a full seal of approval, not uh, certified fresh bullshit, but. Uh, you know? Hey, I, I heard that Rotten Tomatoes was changing the the audience score. Oh, the I only, heard about that too. But yeah, yeah, the only way that you can do that is if you verify your ticket purchase. So eh, maybe that'll kind of balance that out a little bit, or maybe it won't. Well, but it's no not going. If if the movie legitimately sucks, it's not going to stop people from saying that this movie, you know, sucks. Yeah, yeah I think- I, like. I know this is going to kind of contradict everything that we're about to do with giving our recommendations, but do you think now with the internet culture that, because before back in the day, it's either you watched uh, Cisco and Ebert at the movies or you Gene read Shallot on, I forgot what show he was attached uh, yeah, to. Yeah, it was, it was on, Malton, it, on Entertainment yeah. Tonight. Like if you have those resources in like newspaper reviews and the like, I feel Back back in the day, things had legs to them because of word of mouth from the people. Uh, so I guess I pose the question to you: Do you think that now we're we're way more critic based off of our opinions, or do you think that the the word of mouth and the audience still has a voice to sort of keep momentum going with films? I mean, I I kind of feel like critics of essentially for the most part have all been bought to a certain degree. You know, you don't really see a whole lot of, at least the ones that I have frequented for years, most of them are constantly giving positive scores all the time. And that's uh, Harry Knowles, like, Harry Knowles. Oh, he call, was, call, he, he was calling you out, sir. Yeah. 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 You know, and it, it just, I started noticing things that people who reviewed movies that I shared similar tastes with, and we found the same issues with stuff. They were starting to like everything. I thought something's not right here. You know, I kind of felt like, and then I noticed that a lot of these guys do press junkets. You know, they're be, they're interviewing the actors of these movies that that suck. You know, and they're all giving a positive scores. It's almost like, well, once you interview the star of this movie, you're probably not going to go and trash it because, well, you met him in person. Your viewpoint on the movie is different because you actually sat down, shook hands with him or her, laughed and carried on. So therefore, oh, I like him. You know what? Uh, that movie he's was not great. a bad guy. It was great. You know, Jupiter, Jupiter Sunday had Channing Tatum, man. He can't grow a mustache to save his damn life. I mean, he looks great in 20 years. Hey, I mean, to be fair, I can't either. So yeah, but he's Channing Tatum. He's a supposed leading man, you know, but anyway, that's just my, I like a, a slant towards him because I can't, because I can't stand him. <laughs> but, but anyway, I, 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 I just feel like I, I haven't paid attention to critics in so long. I, yeah. I strictly go by, you know, if my brother says something, if you say something, uh, my buddies Matt and Jordan, 
you know, we have similar tastes sometimes to a certain degree. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, I was about to know, say. To a certain degree. To a certain degree. But for the, I keep it pretty limited. And I, I based on, you know, what I see, what how, how movies are sold in the trailers and stuff, I kind of know what to look for. You know, yeah. I know for the most part, I'm like, okay, that's probably something I need to stay clear of. And that looks like something I've already seen before. Mm, okay. Yeah. You've, you've picked my interest. And there are, there are still reviewers online in certain areas and sites that I, I do trust w- with how they view stuff. Now, once you kind of start that shift, then I, I'm kind of like you, I'm like, all right, no. And then uh, kind of find some more. Uh, and I, I think the only way to really do that is to watch it for yourself and yeah. kind of determine how you feel about it and maybe compare it to what you see and kind of uh, pick and choose uh, people that have that similar taste and view it the same. That way you can kind of see, oh, well, they gave that a 7 out of 10. That's How, how am I going to feel about that? And I, I don't know. It, it's a kind of a weird thing that people actually get paid to write write their words down and give their opinions on something and people flock to it and read it and base, it would mean, it would mean it, spending, spending their money on that. And it's uh, same thing for video games. I definitely read reviews for video games because who wants to drop $60 on something that uh, is terrible. But when, you know, because people have been saying it, and you've said it before, you know, people who review video games, certain companies are given paychecks and expected to forcefully say something positive. Yeah. yeah. So therefore, if they're doing it for video games, why the hell do you think it wouldn't be happening with film? And and it's uh, there's been plenty of times where Jeff Gertzman got fired from GameSpot because they had ads running for Kane and Lynch, too, and his review was like, yeah, this game kind of sucks. <laughs> and they were like, uh, you can't you can't do that. So I, I understand the business aspect of it, but you have to have a, a little bit of integrity with that if you're a company to be like, well, we do want to give our honest opinion. Like, yeah, we want to make money and get the, the revenue and the ad dollars, but we also kind of want to be honest about it. And uh, there are some reliable places, but uh, the reviews we're going to give to you briefly before we jump into the commentary uh let's i guess let's start off with john wick three you and i went and saw that last sunday and guess what we didn't have to tell anybody to shut the fuck up and i think i think that like made the the movie the best thing i've seen in in a long time partly because of that yeah (laughs) like i could i can actually just sit and focus on what was going on on the screen and not have to worry about put it in and see like a light over there in the corner. Cause someone's on their phone or like hearing someone actually there weren't too many quiet scenes in this film. No. And the, the, the sound like, uh, it was good. Anyway, I, I'll go ahead and, and let you start and, and give your thoughts. Yeah. For something that, you know, um, I, the only, I was only hesitant because Halle Berry was in it, but I was like, well, you know what? They've sold me on the, on the first two. I won't challenge anything. That's just the one one element. I, I was like, okay, be aware of this. And actually, Holly Berry came in and kicked tons of ass. Best thing I've ever seen her in. Period. And I think that it helped that she didn't overstay her welcome. Like, no, mo- she most didn't of come the- in with like trying to make her own mark. She came in and did what they wanted the character to be. Like, she's not coming in like I'm a big star because I won an Oscar for showing, you know, for being in Monsters Ball and showed my tits. Or, yeah, and, you know. and fuck Billy Bob Thornton. Yeah, she didn't. Uh, she didn't storm it up. In no, this movie. no. So she came in and she did a great job. Everything she does is all her. She has presence, and like Nathan said. She didn't overstay her welcome to the farm. Like, you know what? I would welcome her back in the inevitable fourth film that's already been announced already. Yeah, right? and I guess uh, spoilers involved a little bit in any of these reviews because we may divulge some information about this stuff, that just the the pure storytelling aspect of everything. But she was only in there about a solid, what, 15, 20 minutes or so? I'd say, yeah, maybe 20 minutes of the film she was in it, yeah. From beginning to the very end of her, her uh, time with Keanu in the movie. <laughs> It's already been brought up in the chat. What you got against Halle Berry, Tyler? Uh, well, just go back and watch the X Men films or anything. A Catwoman. I can name a, a bunch of other things. You know, she's just never been a screen presence I've ever respected. She's a beautiful woman, but she didn't have the short pixie hair. 
Um, I just well, don't... I, hey man, not a swordfish, dude. She, she looked good in that. She looked very good in that, but she didn't have the the pixie hair. You know, it was shorter hair, but it wasn't like that short pixie hair kind of thing. Mm. I just don't think she was very good about it in anything I've ever seen her in. I just felt like she's a lot of hype. And and just you know she thinks she's got you know gravitas on screen. I'm like yeah, no. well I, I mean there were some reports that came out. I, what was it during was it X X two that she I, was I guess upset about her screen time. Like she wanted more when clearly the focus had shifted to Hugh Jackman's Wolverine. Well, because for her to act like is like just because you know you're popular in the mainstream right now, and of course her star has you know you know fizzled out quite a bit compared to how it was many years ago but i i just i remember when the cast was on mtv and of course that jerk off uh, carson daly was like so guys including hugh jackman anna paquin uh and pretty much almost the entire damn cast was there and he's asking them all what it was like to work with holly berry as if like it was an absolute treat i mean you guys were completely i mean given the ultimate blessing to work with a presence like holly berry i just felt like man up yours man god it's just like could you be more of an empty talk show host period i mean i don't know who's worth him or jimmy fallon but <laughs> I, I just felt like god you're such a moron like i i hope you were you were fed that question because being the, the you know the ice cube that he is he didn't know what to ask these people because I don't know what an X Men is. That's a, that's that's a cartoon, right? But anyway, I I give credit where credit is due, and she was extremely good in this movie. Her character was very well done, and she doesn't try to be I'm so cool. And no, no, but it'd be cool if I did a double barrel shootout in slow motion like all these other goofy ass Luke Besson movies and stuff like that. She was great. I loved her character. She didn't have a lot of bad dialogue. She was a, a wonderful character, inside and out, from beginning to end. And I, hell, I would welcome even a possible spinoff film of her and her past and stuff like that. Not to say it would be just as great, but it had me intrigued enough to where, okay, I would check it out. And uh, the the beauty of part three is the world just keeps expanding. Yeah, you you find out little little bits and pieces in John Wick one, John Wick two we're unraveling a little more. We're, we're finding out all these characters more about past stuff. And three, it just sort of just blows wide open because he, here he is excommunicado. Uh, what, what the bounty was 14 million got up to $14 million. Yeah. So everybody's out for him. And the beginning of the film is just, you're dropped right into it. He's trying to find a, a safe place and he wants to go to the, the library and Holy shit. That first fight is fantastic. Yeah. And if you guys are, if you love the gunplay and the fights in the first two films, then you're definitely going to love this because uh, we get horses involved. We have swords. Knife fights. Yeah. And ninjas. And, uh, yes. Which kind of leads towards the end of the film. And two of the guys in that were in the raid films. I keep telling Tyler, you got to watch uh, the raid and the raid Two because they're fantastic. And the fight choreography is great. I I don't want to say too much else because I don't want to like. No, we, I think we both agree. We had one issue at the tail end of the film, and the motivation to justify the fourth film. I kind of le- felt like it leaves a little in question. Yeah. Uh, other than I felt like, is it just the fact that he's mad because he just wants to be left alone and still continues to keep being pulled in more and more and more? Like guys, I just want to go home with my damn dog. So I feel like if we were given that. I could buy that, but we're not really given an explanation. So I kind of just feel like it's kind of a force ending to say, we're going to do the fourth film regardless. Yeah. yeah. Other than that, um, it's a great film from beginning to end, a great action sequences, memorable moments, but you um, still like part two overall. Still, Number two is still my favorite. Absolutely. I need to, I need to watch part two again. Yeah, my brother it. didn't like it. He thought part two. He thought everyone was trying to act too cool, and I, I didn't get that at all. Like I get that from the Blade sequels. Like when I think of, of movies where they're, they're trying so hard to be cool, I think of the Blade sequels. You know, I, I, you know, I, I like Blade two. Blade three sucked ass. I think we can all agree on that. But Blade uh, yeah, two to me was yeah. fine. Uh, no, like the the whole blood pack where you got that asshole was in the transporter uh, first one in Fast and Furious, and 
everyone's kind of cocking their head and walking all like this. Like, oh man, yeah, we're brooding and we're cool. Like, no, you're not. So you're just waiting for Gangrel to show up and start bouncing to his music. Well, he has more. I, he, he's not trying hard. He's just having a good time to some cool music. These guys just, you know. You know, oh man, we got tattoos on our body and on our faces. Aren't we cool, man? <laughs> but uh, I tried to rewatch that not too long ago, and I just like I can't, I can't sit through this any further. So I can't do this. Uh, I need to watch part two again. Yeah, as Tyler said, the the ending of this, I, I kind of feel like part three should have been the end. But I'm all, I'm all in for part four. Yeah, I'm sold. Uh, two things before we move on to our next review from the chat. Just let us know. Does the dog die? No, the no, dog does not die. The no, dog, no, 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 the no, dog no. is well taken care of. John Wick knows this. I'll even tell you at the beginning, the dog's following him around. He hops in the the taxi. He's like, "Take me to blah 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 library." They're sitting there. Traffic's backed up. He doesn't have time. Hands the, Yeah, he hands one of his coins to the taxi driver and was like, "Take uh, take him to the the Continental." Gives him a pat on the head, says, good dog. And he's on his way to go murder lots of people. Yeah. Um, the second thing, should John Wick be a TV series or at least some animated shorts? Uh, I, I think it could work to a degree. It wouldn't surprise me if they decided at some point, like, hey, we're going to do like a prequel TV series and show you what John Wick was like before he kind of met his wife and got out of it. I would much rather see it in a like a mature animated form and let Keanu do the voice because I don't want to see another actor try yeah, to yeah. play Keanu. That, like, yeah, I, that, that'd be a that's, good idea. Yeah, I just kind of feel like that's the only way I would want to see it. Doesn't need to be in comic book form. I'd be open to it as long as it's animated and Keanu is and everybody. Ian McShane, Lawrence Fishburne, you know, any of the actors that you see in these movies come back and play. Uh, you know the roles in the past that you know that are part of this world. Then yeah, I'd, I'd be open for it. Sure. All right. So out of five, out of five stars, what do you give John Wick three? Uh, I give it a four. I give it. A, I would give it a four and a half. That four and that. Half. I, I think the the point five is because of that Bush song that plays in the end credits. Gotcha. It's nice to see Bush contributing to a, a movie soundtrack. <laughs> Since American War from Paris, like, like, that's the one. one I, I, feel, I, yeah, I, I know. I feel like that, that <laughs> maybe that's how it happened. But yeah, I love that soundtrack because of, of the, that new version of Mouth they did for that soundtrack. See, I, I bought it I, just for that. Honestly, I don't it, I don't like that remix. I like the oh, original God, version the over original, the remix. The original, no, I, 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 will, I will heartily disagree with you on okay. that. But uh, highly recommended. Please go check that out. If you have not watched any of the other John Wick movies, what are you waiting on? Watch those. Go see part three. Next review, something that you and I were both a little uh, wary about, and it is Batman versus Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Uh, that'll be coming out on Blu-ray next week. Say, next week, but it's not this coming Tuesday, but the following Tuesday, I guess. Right. I think June fourth. Yeah, so we're, we're still about two weeks away. Yeah. But it is available on digital download, which is what we did. We because we saw the trailer and we're like, all right, looks. I mean, the the animation of the turtles look kind of weird in a way, but it, it it sounds good, it looks good, and for the most part, it was. I, I it was uh, the five year old in me was definitely marking out in certain parts of this film, like Batman fighting Shredder, this shit I dreamed of when I was a kid. Uh, but Tyler, I'll, I'll pass it on to you because when it usually comes to watching stuff, you are typically the the one that's harder to impress. Mm -hmm. Dare I say? Because I watch a lot I, of no, shit. No, no, I am. I am very hard to impress. I don't shy away from that, and people may think I'm an asshole for it, but that's just I've seen a lot of good things in my time, and I I, I I'm not going to just settle because well we don't have anything else. Like no, I'm not doing that. Um, and with these DC. Uh, Direct to video films, I've been it, they've been pretty much piss poor. Even the killing joke, like that was the last straw for me. You know, I just I still have yet to watch that, and I guess I shouldn't now because a, a lot of a lot of people, it wasn't just you, a lot of people didn't enjoy. Oh yeah, and I was you know, and I I, I kind of felt that pretty quickly that I was not the only one who felt that way about it. You know, it was just you know, uh, people who know, who've seen it, you know what I'm talking about. Um, 
so I have not been sold really plenty much. I've, I bought some of them and they've been not very rewatchable. I'll just put it that way. They were okay when I first watched them, but that was not enough to draw me back into wanting to watch it again. Um, and I'm not excited at all for Hush. I watched the trailer again the other day just for the hell of it. I'm like, God, I'm just not sold on any of the voice work in it. It just looks, ugh. but anyway, um, I was very surprised by how well this was. There were a couple of bits of dialogue that like, mm. but fortunately the, the, the mix of having fun with this, but also having a bit of a mature tone because people get killed in this. Yeah. Yeah, they do. People get murdered pretty good in this movie. Yeah. And it was just, it was quite refreshing to see the content. And I, I felt like the people who did this were fans of the 1990 Turtles movie and the original incarnation of the Turtles from, you know, various, you know, the, all the incarnations that we grew up on, uh, you know, the, the, the darker or uh, I don't say darker, not, none of the Christopher Nolan versions of Batman, but I just kind of felt like, like Batman looked like the Neil Adams type Batman. That's kind of how he looked. At least that's how I took it. Um, but it, it just felt like they're having fun with it, but they did not, you know, make you feel like it's being dumbed down so that way you and your four-year-old can watch it together. Yeah, I would not recommend watching this with your four-year-old. <laughs> well, and it's not like it's excessively bloody, but, you know, like one foot, foot soldier gets a, a ninja star to the head at the hands of Shredder. Um, a couple of guys get arrows in the back. Um and you know, but it's it's not like any of the heavy hitters get like killed, but you see people like security guards and cannon fodder, so to speak. Like, you know, they don't shy away from taking them out, but it's not excessive gore and it's not focused on. Like you don't see Leo cut a guy in half or cut someone's head off. You know, that I mean that that ninja star to the forehead and blood comes out of the foot soldier's forehead. That's about as bloody as it gets. It doesn't get you know, excessive in it. And it, it's, it's a moderate version to let you know, Hey, we're taking this stuff seriously. And the jokes that are in it, you know, I think they, they took some notes from how Mikey is in the 2012 cartoon. Cause I kind of felt like he was yep. similar to that, that version of Mikey, which I quite enjoy. Um, Robin's voice was a little high pitched for my taste, but not so it, much it, where I felt like it kind of bounced back and forth a little yeah. bit. Some stuff he would say, I, I would hear him and I would just be like, uh, and then other stuff he'd say, I'm like, well, that sounded fine. What happened here? But, I agree. So, but it, it wasn't enough to be like, oh, this is terrible. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the, the basic premise, uh, the turtles have shown up at Gotham because as it turns out, Shredder and, you know what? Since we're doing the commentary today, let, let's nail this to the board. What is the proper pronunciation? Raish Cause hear, al Ghul. Because you hear different things. You hear yeah. Raj, Raish, and, and there's I, one I, more. I mean, honestly, like I've also I read too that you could pronounce it both ways because I've heard it pronounced both ways by people in the industry. And it was even pronounced both ways in, in Batman versus Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Because I would hear different ways. I'm like, oh, well, it's cool that they're throwing that in there. But I, to me, I feel like there needs to be a definitive, this is how it's pronounced and this is how it should sound. Uh, I guess it, guess it kind of depends on, I, I, I kind of feel like it's open to interpret, excuse me, it's open to interpretation. Because right. for years, I was always taught Roz. And then I saw Bruce Tim in an interview call him, pronounce it Raish. And I thought, what? You know, he's probably the last person you want to question on it, but still, I just, and then of course, you see Batman Begins, it's Ra's Hagul. Yeah. So, I, I sh- wouldn't, I'm not going to go and correct anybody if they say Raish or Ra's. I say it however you want to say it. But uh, Raish and Shredder are collaborating because Raish wants <clears throat> the, the, the mutagen. And uh, it, it, it basically follows there. The, the turtles show up. Turtles think Batman has something, so there's a Raz there, and then they end up teaming up, and there's just so much that that goes on. And once again, I don't want to spoil everything, but there are a lot of nice surprises, and uh, for the most part, the voice work is great. It's Troy, very, very similar to the the Batman animated series. Like they they clearly didn't get Kevin Conroy or Mark Hamill or any of the other voice actors, but they do a pretty good job of trying to give us an interpretation of Kevin Conroy's Batman and Mark Hamill's Joker. Like you know, well, similarities. It's, it's pretty impressive that both of those voices are coming from the same person. 
Oh yeah, that's right. I forgot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Troy Baker does the voice of both Batman and Joker in this film. So, and for him to mimic and sound similar to Conroy and Hamill, he does a pretty decent job. Yeah. And it's it's just exciting. Like you know, the, at one point you see you know Leo and Don take on Roz, and you have Batman take on Shredder twice in the film. And just seeing, even though most of the, the Arkham inmates are all mutated when the turtles really come in contact, except for the penguin. They, they fight the penguin at one point uh, at the beginning of the movie. It's just exciting to see the turtles crossing over with not just one or two. Like they, you know, you see Robin um, and uh, Raph and Mikey take on Mr. Freeze, uh, Batgirl and Donnie take on Bane, uh, Poison Ivy's featured in it. Two Faces featured in it. You know, it's it's very it's pretty much. All, I didn't read the first crossover, but it appears to be quite verbatim to that first Turtles Batman crossover where the inmates get tr- mutated to team up with Shredder. I think Roz. I think I don't know. I didn't read it, um, but it seems very very similar from what I do know about it. And um, the tone is pretty consistent. Um, there's some lighthearted moments, but it's nice to know that they did their best to try and keep it serious and not. It was it was a, a, a good fair balance. And yeah. I mean, you have Mikey on one, and I think it may have been one of my favorite parts of it is having Mikey be Mikey, but he's hanging out with Batman in the Batmobile, and you you definitely get that mesh of he's really silly, and here's Batman trying to be all serious, and it, it worked. I, I genuinely like enjoyed when. Penguin takes off and his uh, umbrella turns into a, a helicopter uh, propeller, and there's a, 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 a bat, like a wide shot, and you see Mikey go, you know, Gotham is bonkers, and he falls back in this dust kind of like he hits the ground, like this big kind of dust cloud erupts around him. And it's just funny because it's just like kind of out of focus, and just that he's, you know, it's like the 2012. And then when I, I, I actually thought like, because so many of these remarks could have really made me groan and roll my eyes. And uh, when everyone takes off, commissioner, you know, makes a remark that everyone just took off on. And then Mike's like, I'm still here. And he's like standing behind him and makes yeah. Commissioner Gordon jump. Like, I, yeah, I that, actually, yeah, that, I actually yeah. like that, you know. But uh, um, I, it, I, I, it really, I, really could have been bad with the, the jokes. Like, I didn't like Batgirl taking time to take a selfie of herself with, I, I think, the Joker. Yeah. I won't yeah, say yeah. how it went. I like, uh, look. I don't care what version of Batman, like to see, like the superheroes just don't do that kind of shit. I just, but I digress because it wasn't enough to kill the tone. Yeah. Uh, other than that, no, I, I loved all the versions of the characters. It was nice to see them on screen and interacting. And I loved the fight between Leo and Roz too. Like their, their solo fight was, was pretty uh, badass. And then Shredder and, and Batman's fight glorious as well. So I, I hope we'll get more. Obviously, leaves it open for you know another sequel, but it would just be fun to know that we could get other crossovers that don't have to be mutations all over the place, but or just another Batman film in that same vein, or another Turtles movie in that same vein. Like you know, I just feel like these guys showed enough care. You have my attention if you want to do another one. So, what what would you give it out of five stars? Uh, I would give it a, a a four. Same here. Yeah, I'd give it a four. And I will buy a hard copy of it. Like I, I, yeah. I, I've never bought a digital copy of something in Washington advance. I've always like if I'm gonna do it, I want a hard copy. But for this, I'm like I'll bite the bullet. If it sucks, well, I don't have a hard copy in my collection. But I will be buying this on June fourth already. So I will have two copies of it. So, and I'm actually eager to watch it again. So yeah, same here. Uh, question posed: Any Krang in this film or Rocksteady and Bebop? Unfortunately, no. no but uh, the way they left everything open, and maybe if Batman. Uh, finds his way over in in more of the the turtle universe. Maybe we can we can get those guys. But there are elements like the foot soldiers look like you know comic book related, but they're purple. They're purple and black, kind of like you know the cartoon version where they're purple and not just black. Um, the Shredder, like there's a shot when he confronts Batman for the first time, he comes down much like how Shredder confronts the turtles in the first Turtles film when he drops down into camera in slow motion and then stands up. I just thought that's right out of the 1990 live action film when he confronts Batman for the first time. I'm like, so there's not a lot of fun stuff in there. A lot of serious moments, uh, some fun moments and they, they don't go too crazy and go all Marvel on you. Like jokes, jokes, jokes all around. Who, who wants more jokes and just throw them and, left and right. And when they do it, it's usually left to Mikey to kind of take the, the brunt of that, which 
inevitably works because that's how his character mostly is. Yeah. And most right. of them are pretty good remarks anyway. So that that's our review on both John Wick and Batman versus TMNT. All right. And with that said, let's uh let's jump into this episode of Batman the Animated Series. You said when you text me, you said uh what was it? The the, the demon the demon head part one, but it's actually the demon's quest part one. Oh damn it. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> And I just watched this the other day too. So, I, but you I, know, I, I, uh, that's that's not right. Well, you know what? You know, I've gotten. You know, I do. I'm just giving you shit. Anyway. Yeah. Well, yes, I, I did goof it, but um, you know, I it is what it is. I own my mistakes. I'm not someone who's like I got to hide my mistakes so people think I'm I'm completely perfect in my pop culture knowledge and stuff like that. I mean, I can't. People think I'm a fool and a fake. And, and, and if and if you ever try, I'm just be like, no, he he's wrong. Listen, to this idiot. I'll be there to call you out if you. Yeah, you don't, you I'm don't not ashamed to. about it, but you know, if I forget something, I don't. I don't need. I believe me. All you gotta do is look up the shit on my phone real fast, and you got all the answers anyway. Not that that's what I do, but I'm just saying a lot of this stuff. Like anybody can be a a, a complete wealth of knowledge, a library of, of thoughts and ideas and tr- truths and facts. And I don't have I don't have that much up here in the old noggin anymore. I'm sure well, people are starting. I think people are starting to catch on to that. I, I'm waiting for the day that someone is really upset that I spend time with you guys on Fans of Power because they're like, he doesn't know shit. He doesn't know nothing. Well, I think What's it's safe to say a lot of people there? who listen to Fans of Power don't know a lot of the stuff. Like, they're casual fans, but they enjoy the info and the knowledge, or they have seen stuff they just don't have it memorized as much, or, you know, I, I think you're you're the every every guy. You're the I'm guy. Every, I'm the guy. I'm I'm the yeah I don't even know where I was gonna go with this yeah so you know, but I I you know I don't know I just don't everything. retain information well anymore well, like some stuff I do like I I can tell you uh, a vast majority of the Bash at the Beach 1997 card how about 2000 2000 Bash yeah. at the Beach no <laughs> maybe 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 at one point like obviously I know that that event is infamous for Jeff Jarrett laying down and the promo and Booker T winning the title, but any of the undercard stuff. Yeah. No, I don't. Maybe I had like the kiss demon versus Ernest Miller Van- or something. I Vampiro in a graveyard, I think. Really? Yeah. I was listening to Bishop talk about that on his podcast. Oh, okay. That, that's why you toss <laughs> that one out there. Cause you've been listening to 83 weeks podcast. Mm-hmm. There's a plug for you. Yeah. 83 weeks. Kick-ass wrestling podcast. Man, it, it was weird in a time in WCW in 97 when you like the NWO was white hot, and then you have fucking Ernest Miller and Glacier versus Wrath and Mortis. I'm like, you guys, <laughs> you guys are trying to establish this other thing over here, and then you still have, have the hokey like, gimmicky stuff. Have, have like, yeah, the really, yeah, that even back then that always stood out to me. And even when those matches were on, I was like, I, I don't give a shit about the, like Mortis looks cool. Don't get me wrong. Like that that get up was awesome. I liked it, but at the same time, it was very they didn't do much else with it. Like they just had feuds and stuff. I'm like, if they're gonna be costumes and glaciers doing his sub zero Mortal Man, Kombat. Was bad watching him do that stuff in the ring too. And that, that's the thing too. He debuted when NWO was white hot. I'm like, why well, I, I guess it's because the money invested in it already and the, the outfit and the, the laser show and everything. But if you're gonna do that, like go all out. Like have do that shit where uh Hogan went to the Dungeon of Doom. Have like these weird elaborate sets and just go all out. If it's gonna be hokey and bad anyway, just to crank it up, God. But then, yeah, then you had like really good matches, like Jericho and Ultimo Dragon. That was a fantastic match. Jericho hadn't turned heel yet; he was still like the smiling baby face. But uh, they had a good match. I, I never liked the main event. I always hated that Dennis Rodman stuff. I never liked the uh, how WCW always is like, oh, it's Carl Malone and Dennis Rodman. They've been fighting in the playoffs. Now watch him in the ring. And then the Jay Leno shit. Oh, God. Yeah. Uh, I uh, watched them all, though. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good thing that the WWF was the way it was at the time. Well, at the time, then it didn't last long before they went to shit, too. So. Yeah. But speaking of which, 
AEW w, blah, 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 double or nothing. That's actually today. You guys check that out. AEW October TNT. I don't know. Have you been keeping up with any of that? No, nope, can't say that I have. Yeah, all all of I can't say any of this. All Elite Wrestling got their TV deal. It's gonna be with TNT. All right. Yeah. Starts in October. So finally, a true alternative with some money behind it that isn't going to keep bringing in shitloads and shitloads of ex-WWE stars. They've already said, like, you guys will see some familiar faces that show up, but we're not going to go the route of impact and just, hey, that guy got released. Bring him in. Yep. So because they said not everybody deserves that. And that's true. It's like if uh, uh, Primo and Epico get released, like I don't see them just showing up and collecting the paycheck. Rod the bod. I'm looking at some of the stuff Zen Brown is saying in here. Yeah, the Glacier gimmick was the shits. Like it just, I don't, uh, the thought process. Does Bischoff talk about any of that stuff? Yeah. The, Talks it, about it all. I mean, he, he doesn't shy away from him. He, he and he owns it. If he he said it was his, it, like he said he greenlit that idea, or that's not true. Or was I mean, Glacier his idea? No, but so I, that, I, have, I actually haven't gotten that far into like, or at least because I've kind of gone all over the place. Like I've listened to the Figure Poker Doom episode. I've listened to Bash of the Beast two thousand. I've listened to his debut episode at WWE. I've listened to um, uh, uh, Starcade ninety seven. I listened to. Um, uh, God, oh, oh. Starcade '97 was WCW's WrestleMania 17. Well, actually, because Starcade '97, let's, let's put it. Let's say that WrestleMania. Either way, I'm trying to say Starcade '97 did this first. You had it ready made, and you they they just fucked it up. Well, and he goes into detail about what happened in front of the camera versus what was originally planned. I mean, like they they go. He he avoids graphic details because he's trying to respect, you know, Sting, Steve Borden's like thoughts on all this. And if St- he said if Steve wants to talk about this openly, then I will let him do it. But he says when he showed up the day of Starcade, they really hadn't seen that much of him, and he shows up out of shape and unenthusiastic about the whole match itself. Like he was convinced that they were going to change it and he wasn't going to win the title. So his momentum going into the match was pretty deflated. And Eric and Hogan like, well, he's not in shape. He's deflated like we, and he said there's more to it. But he just felt like, well, if he's not really going to be that into it here, we're going to have to do something to kind of tweak it a little bit because if Sting's not going to do his part to help carry the match over with excitement and momentum, then we're going to, you know, and they, they, they don't talk as if, like, that's the best thing. Like, Bischoff doesn't act as if, like, this solved all the problems because he says it didn't. They had to go. And then, of course, there was a communication error with um, Nick uh, Patrick. Nick Patrick. That's addressed heavily as well. Like, all the stuff. Because the count was supposed to be fast and it looked like yeah. a normal-ass count. Yeah. and all that is addressed. Like, nothing is shied away about that. And any of the other pay-per-view fiascos or Nitro or Thunder stuff, like, uh, I mean, he's he's quite up front, and if he is responsible for it, he will own it and say, no, it wasn't a good idea in hindsight. Or, I mean, I get Sting's viewpoint from that because you're going against Hogan. How is there not going to be politicking involved? Yeah. So I I get that I and this seems around the time frame too that he, Sting was kind of heavy into drugs. Well, and he said he was going through some personal issues as well, yeah, which I think yeah, may have had too. to do with his marriage. So it doesn't yeah. help when you're having like the biggest pay per view of all time with WCW, and your your main one of your main event coach stars is just kind of just deflated and doesn't care. But yeah, I, I hated that because it, it led to so much bullshit. I remember. The, the count was supposed to be fast. It was slow. It was normal. Then you have Bret Hart coming out there. It's like, no, it was fast. It was and that, to... was, that was all thrown in last minute. Like, that was not planned. And that's what, kinda, that's what kind of brings me back to, I still don't think it was just the whole deflated thing. I still think that that was a way for Hogan to politic and inevitably sort of protect his loss. It's like, well, and you see that as it unravels anyway. 
because the first episode of Thunder, you got Dylan, JJ Dylan out there, and he's like, well, well, give me the title back. And then Sting talks for the first time. And then you have the match at Super Brawl because for whatever reason, they didn't have anything that sold out because I, I don't know why they, I guess they, Super Brawl is like one of the, the higher profile shows at the time. Yeah. You have the match, and if I'm not mistaken, I think Macho Man helps Sting win. So Macho Man sort of goes out of the NWO, but then he comes back again. And then like Sting and Macho Man have a match for the belt at Spring Stampede, I want to say. Maybe I'm getting it all. Maybe Spring Stampede was Sting and Scott Hall because Scott Hall finally got the shot from where he won World War III. I don't know. I'd have to look at that again. Some of the stuff's up there. But I just remember that just snowballing into all this other bullshit stuff that even back then I'm like, what is going on? Why can't they just stings the champ, go from there? It's like, no, they got to clusterfuck it and have it. Uh, and uh, then Hogan ends up getting the belt back, I think, eventually. Pretty sure. I don't know. Shit, I got to look at that. Anyway, that's why I put the and more thing on the, the title of this, because you knew, you knew, even if we did the reviews and we stuck to that, somehow we we're going to deviate onto something else. Yeah. Nine times out of ten, it ends up being wrestling. But check out AEW. Even, I don't want to suggest pirating because the event is $50. So I, I thought about maybe spending the money to watch it just to support them, just to see. Because it could be rough going or they might just hit the ground running and it'll be great from the beginning. We'll see how it turns out. But they still got about a good four months until they're on TV. I know they have a couple other events lined up. Uh, Cody Rhodes has said that it's not going to be like impact where they just stay in one spot. They're actually going to be traveling, but there's not going to be house shows. So it's just going to be the TV, TV event. Yeah. So we'll see how that turns out. I'm actually really excited about it because the WWE product has been <clears throat> stale and stagnant and boring and downright drizzling shits the last few years and it's it's gotten worse now and it continues to get worse so this is coming right along at the right time and i think a lot of people who have been burnt out on the product are really wanting this to do well and having tnt having the money see where it goes maybe cm punk will finally show yeah. up and come back to wrestling I, you don't know or a lot of people <laughs> god Terry Funk. He's still wrestling. Yeah. He's retired about 28 times now, but he's he's still going. Anyway, let's uh let's dive on into the Demon's Quest Part 1. No link down below, so uh, search for yourselves on Daily Motion. You got your DVD. Feel free to pop that in. Uh, digital downloads. What have Blu-ray, whatever. Blu yeah. You still got to get that Blu-ray. I just did. I bought it today. Oh, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> It's, it dropped down to uh, just the set without all that pop vinyl bullshit. Yeah, so yeah, seventy dollars yeah. on Amazon. So I bought yeah. it today. Actually, be here Tuesday. Well, good on you, man. Are you? Are you? You're still getting that uh, Prime shipping, I guess, mm -hmm. huh? Mm -hmm. That's weird. Yeah, it is. But maybe maybe you found a way to whatever. Well, I think it's because I use the app. If I use the app, I think I get all the Prime shipping I want. Which is how I've been buying all, my, making all my purchases is just through the app. I don't go to the actual website. Huh. That's so. that's. I didn't know that it kind of worked that way. Zen Brown says, "Punk has been showing up at shows wearing a mask." Yeah, I did. I did see that. I guess he's done that a time or two. Well, he'll show up to friend shows. He's wearing like a ninja mask, give a GTS, and people are like, "That's not him." That's not him. it. Turns out, yeah, yeah, it was him. So that's kind of it's kind of neat. I don't feel like that fire is gone as most people were kind of thinking. And I know some were like, he went and did MMA and he failed and all this shit. And I'm like, yeah, but he, he wanted to try. He did something that he genuinely loves. And yeah, he wasn't that good at it, but at least he tried. And people like, just come back to wrestling. And he's not ready yet. And I think when he is, he will, but I don't, it won't be with WWE. No. Now that there is an alternative with lots of money, make that money. I'd like to see him again. I've always enjoyed his work. Yeah, he can be an asshole. But that's what makes him a good wrestler though. But he's uh at least he's honest. He's he's true to himself. All right. 
The Demon's Quest Part 1. Tyler, go ahead and give us a countdown and we'll get All it right. going. Three, two, one, action. Almost thought my DVD wasn't going to play for a second. Now, um, in regards to like this episode and, and Roz in general, like as a kid, I was not a fan of him. Um, yeah, same I didn't here. find it to be a, a very like composing villain. Um, and actually, my buddy Matt Hilton was like a big advocate for uh, Roz as a kid. Like he's like, no, 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 dude. You like, he's this and he's that. And I was just like, eh, I, I just, I just don't care. And, <laughs> but he's boring. Yeah, yeah. And compared to like Joker, Two Face, Riddler, Catwoman, Mister Freeze, I just, I just didn't find him. And, and of course. As an adult, I'm like, oh my god! Like, what was I thinking? Um, he's a phenomenal villain, and uh, it's it's great that he um, was given great treatment in the show. Of course, you wouldn't expect anything less from you know the good people behind the show that everybody, because um, this this cartoon was such a great gateway to characters that um, if you never heard of them before, or uh, or so many uh, issues of the comic book that were unavailable and still remain unavailable unless you have a shitload of cash or willing to buy a bunch of trade paperbacks to actually get to read them. Or if you get DC Universe, which I uh, saw that you know, on top of their uh, original programming, you can stream, you know, uh, or you can read uh, comic books, all of DC's back catalog, much like how Marvel uh, Unlimited is doing. But um, so maybe I, like, I, I really enjoy that shot right there of Robin climbing oh, up in the yeah, way that they, they the rain, did yeah. the rain. And I also want to add too. That we'll get to this in a second, but it's cool that they've started off the episode and then we get the title card a little yeah. ways into it. It's, it's a, a nice little, little different. Touch. Yeah. yeah, it's a nice touch. And as far as I know, because I I have yet to have the good fortune of actually reading the hard copy of Roz's first appearance, but as far as I know, like the vast majority of this is verbatim right out of the comic. Um, I think it's Batman uh, and Robin the team the team. Uh, Teen Boy Wonder, I think, issue 233 or 232, I think. Um, everything. and um, But when I finally went back and revisited this episode as a, as a young adult, like I, I thought, like, wow, this is an amazing character. And David Warner, who uh, I, I wish was voicing Roz and everything, because he clearly, like... I, I mean, I think to me, he's still the definitive version. Like, I know we haven't had too many versions of it outside of a few uh, animated uh, films. And, of course, you got Liam Neeson, who did a great job. Unfortunately, it was just, you know, not. Uh, <laughs> well, well we, we already know that. You, right. At least you know my views on it. We're not going back down that road. But uh, it's just it's so cool that these guys, you know, because Roz is a serious character. He's not someone who's going to be doing like, you know a Joker story or a, a Riddler story. He's, you know, a, a much more mature villain, you know? That, and, because... and, and honestly, just the biggest threat, really. He does but... hold a much more like a global threat as opposed to, you know, Joker could, you know, threaten the city. Well, a lot of the villains could threaten the city or threaten a group of people. But yeah, Roz, Roz is, he, he's a global mastermind. I'm going to bring this up to uh, fill a little bit of the dare dare that we've had. Did you have any issue with essentially the turtles just walking into the Batcave and Batman versus no, TMNT? No, because I, I felt like there needs to be some sort of like equality between the two. Like when they come in, Batman kicks the rest. I kind of felt like, well, I'd like to see them established as equals to a certain extent, but for them to just find their way into the Batcave like that, it's a testament to Donatello's intelligence. And that their equipment is pretty advanced for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So it was nice to have them, you know, depicted in a way that, well, no one's, not too many people have ever found the way into the Batcave voluntarily like that. And they do it by accident. Not that they're looking for it, but they're just trying to follow, follow you know, where Batman is at. And so I, I like that. If, if Batman beat them physically, well, they, they kind of broke, like, his biggest... Um, uh, of sins is you know coming into the Batcave like that, so it was nice to see them kind of one up Batman in that regard. 
I like the exchange and dialogue in this scene because it, it you don't really know what's going on and it's kind of opening it up a little bit. Like, yeah. I'm old, I'm older than you think. And you're like, well, what does that mean? Yeah, it's really something that, you know, if you're, if you're familiar with the character, you're like, oh, man, they're really paying attention to detail. But to, to anybody else, you know, for me as a kid, yeah. If I, and I, I didn't, I remember when this was average or on TV, but I, I just didn't, it didn't resonate with me. It really didn't. Because I just didn't see Roz as like a, a, a threat. Because, and that's, that's one of those things too, as a kid, like I was more about the physical, you know, which is, but I like the Riddler though. But Roz's character, like his his demeanor, his dialect, it's it's a lot more mature and intelligent. You know, it's 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 a lot more um, adult oriented. He's not talking like your typical villain of the week kind of thing. I mean, there, there's a lot of mystery to the character. A lot of um, he's just such a, a unique character that that Denny O'Neill and, and Neil Adams, when they brought him together with their art and their words. I mean, they, they really came up with a wonderful uh, villain that has, you know, made quite an impression that has, you know, continued to last and be used in various stories over the years. And with his daughter, Talia, who was, I just, I think is a wonderful character, who was completely misused in the <laughs> shitty Dark Knight Rises. Yeah, I, wait, it would have uh, made that seem better if, like, when she, like, kept talking and talking, she finally died, then she, like, took a big shit. And you could hear, like, a big fart when she's like, Ugh. you know, that would have been great. <laughs> and it, I think one of the uh, cool things about this episode is we're not just in Gotham; we're uh, moving around the globe. Yeah, it, it makes me feel like we're you know watching Indiana Jones style episode of Batman, and I I like like this you know this kind of build up with Batman's tension towards Ubu. Like that's two, because like okay, when is three coming? At what point does he decide I'm going to whip this guy's ass now? Like he's going along with it. Because as we, and of course, you're seeing that right there, where Roz is like enjoying what he's seeing here. You know, you you know, Roz is behind whatever their their um, whatever this quest is. If you're watching yeah. it for the first time, you know something's. Well, I I feel like most people by this point, unless you are a, a kid or conditioned to, well, this probably is a setup. But it, it makes sense from a storytelling standpoint as well. Like, you don't feel like it's just kind of written conveniently. Oh, Batman knew all along. You know, like, like how some lazy writers will do. You know, for this story, it makes sense as a detective. You know, this guy gets into your Batcave, all right? Well, clearly, this guy's very smart. Something's up. You know, you have to play along. You know, and a lot of great heroes have to play along with the villains to kind of figure out what the real deal is going on because... A smart villain is not just going to come out and tell you everything right away. And Roz is, is, is by far probably his most intelligent villain in terms of equality and everything. Like, you know, they, they, what's really cool about Roz, too, is that these guys throughout the comics have a mutual respect for each other. You know, it's not like, you know, Batman clearly stands for everything, uh, or Batman he stands completely against Roz's viewpoints on how the world should be um, treated and ruled. Um, not, you know, Batman realizes there's a lot of crime and evil in this world that needs to be done away with, but not by Roz's methods. But Roz respects his intelligence, his physicality, how well trained he is, his that he looks at him as an equal. And and we're kind of getting that right here where they're talking, yeah. where he, he right there. Does, does your money solve this problem? No. Which it, it's one of those things that uh, that is a, a legitimate concern it's like you can only do so much with so many things and, yeah and someone else can have a viewpoint of like well yeah that didn't fix it this probably would but it might not be the right thing to do or the right answer and you kind of bring in the question of sort of that gray area of well ultimately for this solution what is right and what is wrong and, and it can and that, get that, weird yeah, and that's what makes his Roz's character so intriguing too. Like he's he's all about trying to rid the world of, you know, evil and corruption by doing evil and, you know, pretty much using the same methods to to rid the world of what he's against. Um 
but he comes off as someone who clearly could could manipulate someone into believing that mindset, you know, because he doesn't come off as like a, a truly evil man, um, even though he clearly is. Uh, and then using his hot ass Are, daughter to, you know. aren't those like the the scariest kinds of villains? The ones that do yeah. them, that that pull their motto, and it's like I'm a good guy. Yeah. Yeah, who clearly are a cult leader, who you know, <laughs> they present themselves as salt of the earth. I'm just like you, but behind closed doors, you know, the the world will be cleansed when it has been fully customized with the face of a motto all over flags uh, all over the world. And you have like this, like, you know, Nazi propaganda footage of, you know, Joe Amato leading his troops and, you know, acro across the world. And he's telling everybody, have a powerful day. I'm kind of glad we weren't able to see the rest of your hand because I don't want to know. I had it closed. Okay. I did, believe me, <laughs> I would never, ever do that. I, yeah. You know, it, Wayne did it in Wayne's World too. So that, that was my kind of throwback to Wayne when he says, party on, throws a fist up. But uh, it's it, it, this, again, to all, this, all these fun sequences that aren't really Batman taking on a Two Face or a Joker and seeing these, these, fights that are simplistic but they're very action oriented as well I, I i know for a fact i just did not appreciate any of this as a kid um as an adult i i, I think there's some i think it's some of the best both part one and two of the entire series um i just you know i hate that i had that viewpoint on this character but you know i i had my particular taste as a child you know that's why when i watched the 60s Batman show, if certain villains were not in it, I would sit and watch it, but begrudgingly yeah. because I'm like, ugh. Yeah. You know, it does, it, it, ah. yeah, yeah, it sort of takes the wind out of your sails when you're a kid. Because you, I guess you just have a certain expectation. If you know it's going to be a Joker episode, you know that you're in for like crazy fun and like yeah. outlandish set pieces. And with this, it, it is cerebral. Like, yeah. It, it Demand. It's an episode that may, you're expected to think. It's not like throwing it out there in front of you. Yeah, it's already. not bright, bright lights, explosions the entire time. It's... Yeah, and I, I really commend those guys because th that's what I think a lot of times is probably lacking a lot of current children's television, that they, they're, not, they're afraid to take chances like this. Like, you kind of feel like, you know, I don't, as far as I know, there's not a current Batman cartoon going on right now, and it hasn't been for quite some time. But the way they present, you know, superheroes to kiss today, I mean, they would never, I mean, this, most of this entire series, if, if there was a, a comic book based, you know, I mean, if they were going to do an episode based on a comic book, they were pretty much going to do the comic book. They were not going, I mean, they have to tweak a few things because, you know, you got to get it within 22 minutes and certain content can't be used. But for the most part, they're going to, you know, treat the source material with all the dignity they possibly can. Whereas today, it's all about taking as many liberties as you can. Um, and yet, people are so quick to forget that this the show is constantly referred to and celebrated, and people constantly looking back at this when a new version of Batman comes out. And like, it's not about nostalgia, people. You know, you got to get it through your head that people around our age group and older, or even slightly younger, where I mean, as much as nostalgia is playing a big part in our lives, that's not the reason I go back to Batman. I go back to Batman the animated series because it was a damn good animated series next to 89 dare say the best version of batman we've ever gotten to this day anything revolving around the universe that bruce tim and paul dini and um the various other talents behind this show like from phantasm to sub-zero batman beyond justice league that entire universe itself of animation is by far the best um i mean it's, and it's good to see in this animated series, the villains are using actual guns with bullets and firepower coming out of them, and not lasers and stuff like that. And to hear the sounds of machine guns firing at Batman, you know, it was it was it's just nice to see all that and to see the the vast scope of this episode too, going all various parts. You know, uh, it's just it just makes one fascinating tale. It really does. But could be a little boring when we were like As six a child, or seven yes, years old. I, I could see this that if I was being asked to sit, or like if they were playing, you know, because 
it was one and done, like on Fox in the afternoons. They would play one episode a day. If it was a two party, you had to wait till the next day to see it. And, um, you know, episodes like this, just like Vendetta, the first episode that Killer Croc shows up in. I watched it, couldn't wait to see Killer Croc, but I was bored out of my mind by that episode as a kid. As an adult, it's a great episode because it's a much more uh, story driven episode. It's not a by the numbers action episode. I, but this episode does do a good job of putting in the action beats to. Kind oh of yeah, like it's not. To. Oh no, and and they're all great action sequences. We see Batman kick a lot of ass and being depicted as the serious yeah, badass. That, that was a good shot right there with him kind of gritting his teeth. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking of when I was saying that. And I I just. Love how Robin's portrayed in this. That even though a lot of times he gets captured, like he is in the comics, you don't feel like he's a he's a pussy or anything like that, like a, a laughable sidekick. Like I still love Robin in this show. I mean, can you imagine like anybody having to go through this kind of hell to, to say that you know, okay, you're you're worthy of marrying my daughter, but you get a good look at Talia, you know. <laughs> kind of worth going through a hell and back just to like, so I have your blessing to marry her? <laughs> Where do I sign? <laughs> Could you just imagine like that this is how it's like anytime that you you need... Yeah, imagine you, like, people you, asking for, for their daughter's hand in marriage they have to go to their father. Next thing you know, you're going to Calcutta suddenly. And then My Malaysia. My daughter's been kidnapped. Yeah, and Malaysia yeah. taking on panthers and goons and you know, axes being thrown at you, and a, a big bald headed muscles, you know, shoving you out of the way. And, you know, <laughs> we respect you. Thank you for kicking our ass. We'll be on our way. Dinner's at six. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I just love how David Warner, like, when he says detective. You know, I just, he's, he just, oh boy, look at her. Good God almighty. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that Robin's just a stun too. Like, <laughs> all right. And just how she's depicted, like she's just, oh man, it just makes for great storytelling. It, man, it really does. Just, that whole dynamic of, of Batman and Talia and Raw is it's it's just a great triangle of characters interacting with each other. And the constant headbutting emotion. There you go. Like, yeah. That's what just wait waiting to happen. Man, they, yeah. they really want to hammer in just <laughs> <laughs> just... I was like, well, Roz, I'd be more than happy to give you the song, but I'm not going to make a full commitment here. <laughs> and you have a lot of money. Uh, let's let's not let that go either. Like, yeah, he's worthy abilities wise and his fighting skills, but he does have a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah, she, yeah, she's hot. Yeah. <laughs> See, th this alone, and th when when you watch this and you realize just how, you know, it kind of was all right with Roz in the Nolan trilogy and just how poorly it was executed come Dark Knight Rises. Like, these characters should have been given their own film. Like, Roz and Talia. And there's still room for improvement. And that's why, you know, as much as I balk at the idea of, well, here comes one of us with another late, lame-ass attempt at another beloved superhero that's going to fail miserably but go over well with people who don't know jack shit about comic books, which is fine because at the end of the day, it's all about making money. I get it. I'm not blind to that. But telling this story and giving us the Lazarus Pit, which we never got anything. No, we got the pit, you know. And Dark Knight Rises, like I want, I would love to see this on the big screen and see, you know, a beautiful tally, not the dumpy version we got from that girl that was in Inception, whatever the hell her name was.
And the pit is also a good way of done well to, to and I, I guess they have attempted it over the years through the comics. Well, I mean, obviously, you know, it, it can it can be a good plot device, but it can also be kind of a lazy one in a way too. It could be easily overused, and I I was kind of like on the fence, like when they brought Jason Todd back and. He was brought back by using the Lazarus Pit. The the Riddler somehow got in with Jason Todd's corpse, put him in there, and brought him back. But in the story, you know, which I I thought it worked to wrap up the story that when Riddler lets Batman know, you know, I know you're Bruce Wayne, you know, and when Batman realizes how Jason came back by you, the use of the Lazarus Pit, well, you won't tell anybody my secret because Roz is still looking for whoever broke in and used his Lazarus Pit. Like, I thought that was a great way of ending the story, even though I found the Hush character to be a bit lackluster because of the use of Roz in the Hush story. Uh, it was a great way of, of kind of wrapping up the feud between Batman and Riddler. And also, that was a very cool shot. Yeah. With very, the, with the, with now the, this, uh, him laughing maniacally, like, it's just a great way of ending the episode and the uh, inevitable threat of violence towards... Uh, oh, Lord. You bet your ass I'd be attacking Roz right now. <laughs> What's gonna happen? You guys are gonna have to find out next time. I guess yeah. we I guess we can do part two next. Well, yeah, part two next week, maybe. I we've been putting off so many things too, but I do potentially have to work next Saturday, so we'll, maybe we should just do part two. Yeah, if you have to, week. then we can squeeze in this one relatively quickly. Uh, aside from, you know, even though today has been like what three hour episode. No, it's, it's only <laughs> been. I don't know how long it's been. We'll look at the timestamp once we uh, once we stop it. But that's the Demon's Quest Part One, and uh, hopefully you all enjoyed our our thoughts and and. Uh, ramblings and ramblings bash, during bash the at the beaches that was the other thing i missed the like the the sets too like wwe doesn't do that anymore it's just like plain plain sets like wcw had like bash at the beach you had like the, the lifeguard towers yeah. and the sand and it's just halloween more... havoc had like the yeah the whole, yeah Plus, yeah. it's a cool name for a pay-per-view anyway halloween havoc i, I know one of the coolest i know when they 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 don't no, nah, because it. it wasn't Vince's idea. We're gonna go with you know, no mercy, unforgiven, and or hey, uh, next month is WWE stomping grounds. God, man, they just get worse and worse. And Vince's yeah. like, I love it. Yeah, it's 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 pretty bad. Ugh. But anyway, we hope you guys enjoyed, uh, especially the Sturgis rally. Yeah, th those were cool, even though the bikers didn't give two fucks, and basically Bischoff just took that as like a. Uh, was, no, right, you know, yeah. all these the surges, yeah, yeah, that was his whole thing. But no, it, it was cool. Uh, the Travis Trick concert sucked ass. I'm glad they put that at the very, very tail end of the show because I never had to like once the main event was done, stop rewind. Like I do have that recorded, but uh, ugh. don't know why they ever did that stuff. But we hope you enjoyed part one. We hope you enjoyed all the wrestle talk. We hope that you liked what we had to say about the, the two new movie releases that we checked out last week. Tyler, and I want to welcome any kind of suggestions for future episodes. Listeners, you know, if you have character or a uh, certain series or episodes you'd like us to cover, feel free to throw them out. You know, we may not get to them immediately, but you know, it's nice to, you know, take suggestions from people, you know? So, yeah. Permitting it's a good cartoon and not shit. <laughs> I one one of these days we will watch something that's not so great. Just to are you kidding? Of all the series we've already tackled already that have got great episodes, you really think we're going to take time to yes, you know, I to wanna... do a really bad yeah Ninja Turtles I think, episode? I, I, I think, like, yes, why? Why? because because it it needs to be then covered. You better be you better be like as funny as you are like at two o'clock no. in the morning watching Doc, no. you know, Jim Mint Ten commercials. No, we gotta we gotta break down why it's bad. Mm. And watch you squirm and struggle because people think it's funny when you're mad about stuff. Oh, do they? I don't get any. Kind of uh, yeah, like hey, that. that's think... what Zen Brown. That's what we should do. We should uh, we should do the Netflix Shira. That's what we should do. We should watch the prom episode. 
Because that I'm one, not going to advertise that. Because that one was bad. No, yeah, we won't do that. I can't put Tyler. No, then we that. get people thinking we're a bunch of Trump supporters and that we hate gay people and all kinds of other Nazi bullshit. <laughs> that went in various different directions. Oh, uh, because I think that's the consensus that if you show you like you hate, you don't like the new Shiver cartoon. Well, then you don't like this. And you don't like that. And you're a hate monger because you're supposed to embrace this. It's meant for 10 year old girls, even though these are other grown ass men saying they watch it too. Yeah, I. I... I, I, I don't <laughs> even some rounds like, yeah, 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 it did kind of just, it was weird. Like the, the few sentences before that, just how it like here, here and the frayed. Anyway, we hope you guys enjoyed like the episode. Give it a thumbs down. If, if you didn't, that, that's fair too. leave. Yeah, a we don't discourage. Yeah. Something bad, negative to say you're, you're not going to come after you, you know, <laughs> I mean, Tyler might leave a comment down below and uh, let us know what you thought. Anything you want to add, pro wrestling, whatever. Anything we had to say, give us your thoughts. If you are new to this channel, make sure you uh, subscribe and do all that other stuff I just said. Check out all the links down below. Hit Joe up for a custom. Buy one of his t-shirts. And check out Fans of Power, the He-Man and Master Universe podcast hosted by Tyler Baker, Joe Amato, and myself. You can find that at youtube.com slash fans of power podcast. Download us on Podbean. Download us on iTunes. And you guys that listen to us on the regular, because I, I know there's one one listener in particular who's like, hey, man, where's this episode? I'm like, you got to you got to talk to Doug on that one because I sent it to him. Hop on over to the YouTube channel. Give us a subscribe. Support the channel. Tyler, you got anything else to add before we. Uh, check us out on iTunes as well. If you if you prefer to listen to all your podcasts on iTunes, look up Pop Culture Network and you should be able to find fans of power. The Beyond Retro episodes are there, and all the case and commentaries. Nathan's Wrestling Podcast is probably on there as well. Yep, Transitional um, Champion Podcast. That's once a month now. After yeah. the, maybe that'll change in October once once TV picks up for AEW. We'll see. We'll talk well, about it. But yeah, check out iTunes as well if if you uh, if that's your preference for podcasts as well. Just to let you know, we are available on there as well. Just not under our immediate names. You have yeah. to look up Pop Culture Network, and then everything pops up. So. Yeah, you know, and share words. You know, if you like us, you know, let us know too. You know, we we thrive on comments, and you know, whether you like like it or not, we thrive to let know. Can you at least acknowledge us for God's sake, man? You know, <laughs> let us know we're either doing something wrong or right here, people. It's just it's nice to know that our efforts are appreciated. You know? <laughs> so, I don't know, this Tyler just going out there please guys please, yeah, guys. Please, yeah. just yeah. listen I'm, I'm like i'm like joke stands out like you know trying to get you know girls on the girls gonna want to show their tits you know please man i gotta get paid yeah the, the desperation and those things it, it, it was kind of pathetic because you don't get that as much in the advertising that they do no. they're like girls showing their tits look at this jet and if you actually sit down and ever watched one it's basically on erotic thing you've ever seen like yeah Girls begrudgingly lifting their shirts up. There's not. There's, I can't think of a lesser turn on than that. Yeah, it's it's so it's <laughs> it's pathetic. And they sold millions of those. Things. I know. It, it, like just in someone's hotel room. Oh, hey, can you just take off your shirt? Come on, come on. They're like, no, I don't do it. I don't, don't want to. And then it's real quick. Come on. Like, oh man, yeah, you did it. And that's it. Transition yeah. to the next one. To girls dancing and dudes grinding on them. Have you ever been to Top of the Stairs? No, but I, I've heard. Some You've heard stuff. stories. I've never been there, but I just imagine that like all the dudes in there are kind of like the the wind up toys, where like you wind them up and then they just start like moving and just like air humping, like waiting to find a girl to grind on. It's, it's pathetic. I imagine that's probably how how it is with most of those taverns and bars and and downtown Blacksburg anyway. You know, no, not all of them. Just well, uh, top, just top of the stairs. Well, of course, not the cellar. You know, no, yeah, not the cellar. Uh, Sharky's isn't too bad. Champs is kind of douchey. <laughs> yeah, I, I went in there a few years ago and just walked in. I'm like, hey, this is douchey. Like you just you see the people and it's just a bunch of bros like hanging out. Ugh. And I'm just like, I can't do this. I can't be in here. I don't like this. But yeah, Girls Gone Wild was was sad. 
And even Zen Brown said the concept <laughs> was fresh at the time. It was. I mean, obviously, they marketed it very well. They became very rich. But very I, I quick. think I didn't know anybody who actually had seen it until me, Nathan. I think my brother came over too. I think we all sat down and watched because I think he had borrowed one from somebody. And yeah. We're like, this is it. Like, this is what all the hype for these years has been is just girls like fighting to show you anything while some guys like behind the camera, please, please. And, it's yeah, like, almost shit it, off. Yeah, just it, it basically just pressuring into doing it. Yeah, it's it was terrible. I'm, yeah. I'm, the, because I don't have cable, so I yeah, don't know I don't if that it. is still a thing. I hope it isn't. <sighs> but it makes for great laughs, and because yeah. we watch those infomercials, and you know, being up super late, I'm half asleep, and Nathan's half asleep, and he's funny as ever at two o'clock in the morning making fun of those infomercials or anything we'd see on QVC or MT anything MTV is advertising at two o'clock in the morning is funny as hell when Nathan's like, you know, the nine now that he is, but he's sleepy as well. And God, he's, he had to go, go on tour, like half asleep. I mean, cause he's a comedic genius when he's like half asleep, man. It's just, I don't know what it is. It's just, he's on man. <laughs> but uh, girls gone wild. Yeah. <laughs> Who knew we'd be talking about that today? <laughs> anyway, we hope you guys enjoyed. As Tyler begged you to do, like Doug, Doug Stan, his name is Doug Stanhope. But we I know always, we always called him Doug Stanza because we couldn't, we didn't pay attention or care enough to, so we just called him Doug Stanza. Yeah, yeah. The whole thing was just like, oh, I'm Doug Stanza. Show me your tits, please, please. Show, show him like you know, doing like MTV the ground, like running up against girls with his. I gotta get paid. So yeah, he's like the slubby, fun. like, you know, brother of somebody, you know, he yeah. just looks like this complete, you know. Well, now I'm kind of curious if he even still has a career. He may, he may have killed himself. <laughs> <laughs> he's hanging by his neck in his fucking closet. <laughs> Basketball reference. Yeah. Yeah. 52. Oh, man, his Wikipedia picture. He looks like a douche. <laughs> Hang on. Hang on. I'll, I'll, I'll screen share this. <laughs> And that's also the, the beauty of the YouTube channel, all of you you audio listeners out there. You get to see our ugly mugs, but then you also... And it's going to get weird because I don't have multiple monitors, so apologies for this. Let me put that on me. There we go. Look at him. Yeah, he's got douche written all over him. Yeah, he's a douchebag. So just imagine this guy just a pimping out a thing of like just chicks. We just ima- we- yeah, we just his- imagine he's the one behind the camera all the time. Yeah. So just a picture of that face. Can I? Oh. Thought I could zoom in on it, but it doesn't really do anything. All right. I'll, I'll stop sharing there. But yeah, there we go. <laughs> Hope you guys enjoyed. And we will see you next week for part two or maybe something else. We'll, yep. we'll see. We'll, we'll see, see how it happens. goes. But thanks for joining us. And until then, we will see you in the future to talk about the past. Take care, everybody. Later.